Now, uh, before we address questions to Simulas, before I, Hans Klevers will give a talk. Hans Klevers obtained his uh, master uh, MD degree in and PhD degree both at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. He did his postdoctoral work at uh, the Koch, mit Cox Terhorst at the Dana Faber Institute at the Harvard University in Boston. And shortly after, he was already professor in immunology of the University of Utrecht and, prof and professor of molecular genetics. And from 2012 to 2000, uh, 2002 to 2012, he was director of the Huprecht Institute in Utrecht. From 2012 to 15, he was the president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. And from 2015 to 2019, he was director of research of the Princess Maxima Center for Pediatric Oncology. So throughout his career, Hans Klevers worked on stem cells and cancer. He made fundamental discoveries in adult stem cell biology and colon cancer. And possibly his worldwide known best known scientific contribution are methods to grow ever expanding mini organs or organoids from stem cells derived from a range of healthy and diseased human tissues. So Hans Klevers is a member of the Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Sciences of the USA, and, uh, and the Academy of Sciences and the Orden pour le mérite de Wissenschaften und Künste and got many international high-ranking prizes. Just to name a few is the Heineken Prize. I think the Netherlands, the people from the Netherlands are very proud about the Heineken Prize because also of that they have a very good, very good beer they produce. But he also got a breakthrough prize in life sciences and the Kerber or European Science, uh, Science Prize in 2016. And since this year, it's very interesting also the development, Hans Klevers acts as the head of the pharma research and early development of the pharma company Roche in Switzerland, where he possibly brings his organoids to, uh, to, the, to their relevance in medical research and development. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Daniel. I must say it still feels a little bit like acting as head of, uh, of Roche research, but <laughs> you can tell you could say it later. So uh, yeah, what you saw uh, during this introduction was uh, one of our organs, the gut. And uh, as you know, as you all know, we consist, our bodies consist of tissues. Organs consist of tissues, tissues consist of cells, and what you probably not all realize is that our cells don't live as long as, uh, as we live. Let me see if this works, yeah. So um, some of our cells actually live only days or weeks or months. And um, our organs have dedicated stem cells. I'll say a little bit about the other type of stem cell, but these are called tissue stem cells or adult stem cells. There are many different types. Still a number of them need to be uh, discovered. Uh, and what these stem cells do, they, they, they keep an eye on how their organ is doing, and when cells get lost, either by natural attrition or by diseases or by damage, they, could, they come in action, they divide, they produce daughter cells, and those daughter cells uh, then mature out into the right cell types of that particular organ. Now, these are not the stem cells that, for instance, can make embryos. They, they're called embryonic stem cells, ES cells, and there's a synthetic version uh, invented by Shinya Yamanaka, 15 years ago or so called iPS cells. Uh, those cells can make everything. The stem cells that I'll mostly be talking about can only make the organ in which they reside. This is a very important distinction. Often people uh, and also many companies uh, don't really realize that this is the case. Now what you saw was the, uh, was the gut. The gut has these, these bumps that are called villi. They uh, extend the surface area so that you can digest food more efficiently and take the nutrients up. Um, in between are the so-called crypts. They were, they were actually discovered by uh, Lieberkuhn and the people who've done a medical or biological study here might, might remember the crypts of Lieberkuhn. So Lieberkuhn is a young German scientist in the, in the what is it, 18th century who uh, discovered the, the regions in the gut where the stem cells presumably reside. And actually that is when uh, religion and science still spoke the same language, uh, Latin as you can see here. And these were images from his, uh, his thesis. Now, um, 
it was known since maybe six, the, the 1940s that the inner lining of the gut, we call that the epithelium, so these are the cells that take up the nutrients from your food, they are the most rapidly self-renewing part of your body. So every in a mouse, every five days, the entire lining of the gut is replaced, so cells work very hard for five days, they die, uh, and new cells are formed from gut stem cells. And uh, actually, we, uh, we provided the final... Uh, proof that these tiny little cells that are already seen by uh, Joseph Panet, a Viennese uh, um, pathologist in the in the 19th century, um, and you see them there indicated with an with an S. Uh, in my lab, using uh, genetic uh, methods that are discussed here, we actually created a mouse where these tiny little cells at the base of the crypts. You see them here in green. Every stripe is a is a uh, is a single green cell. Um, uh, they emit a green light, so as you know, normally mice don't emit a light. Uh, these do. They might listen to sounds, actually, but uh, these emit. And every cell that emits light was our potential stem cell. Now, with tricks that I won't discuss, we could prove that they indeed were these most active stem cells. No, oh, this doesn't work. Can you? Yeah. Um, oh, now it goes too fast. Yeah. Um, that we, we could actually show that these are the most active stem cells of the human or mouse body. Many things were wrong, at least when you read the, uh, the textbooks on the, how stem cells should behave and what they should look like. Uh, eventually, I think we could convince the field they were indeed the stem cells. And most importantly, people believe that stem cells, first of all, you cannot grow them in culture adult stem cells, and second, uh, they rarely divide, although that's the only thing they need to do when they repair a tissue, that they can only divide to make daughter cells. Yet it was strongly believed by everybody, including us, that stem cells shouldn't do that too often because it's dangerous to divide. You have to copy your genome, you can make mistakes, maybe you become a cancer cell, maybe you get lost, and that's not what you want with the stem cells. Now, what we found is these, these cells divide every day. Logistics are enormous. In a mouse gut, they, a single stem cell goes through 1,000 cell divisions. If you're a biologist, you know how complex that is. And in, uh, in our body, it's about 20,000 consecutive uh, stem cell divisions done by a single cell. Now, based on this, uh, Toshi Sato, a, a Japanese gastroenterologist uh, who did a postdoc in my lab, um, sat down with a few of us in the lab and we, we tried to design conditions under which we could culture these cells. And you have to realize that almost all the human cells that are being used uh, in the labs around the world since the last 60, 70, 80 years are cancer cells. They usually come from tumors uh, or they have cells have been put in culture, many died and eventually one started growing and dividing because it had undergone uh, oncogenic, carcinogenic uh, cancer mutations. Now these cells, uh, actually we can, we can coerce to divide and the plan was really to start with one stem cell and make many stem cells, gut stem cells. But we, what happened was something very different. We got these structures uh, they grow very uh, vigorously. Um, for many years, mice live about three years maximum. These cultures have now been around for more than 15 years. But as far as we can tell, they're normal. When we sequence their genome, their DNA, we see no cancer mutations very much against what people believe that, that human cells or mouse cells in this case and culture should do. So they look like normal. Uh, we then decided to really test this by transplanting. And this was done uh, by Toshi in my lab, in Mamoru Watanabe's lab in Tokyo. So Toshi from one of these mice where the stem cells emit a green light so we could easily sort the stem cells away from all the other cells. We grew them up. So one cell was grown up to about 100 million cells or so, frozen, sent to Tokyo. And there they were transplanted through the anuses of several dozen mice. Again, it's the offspring of one cell. Um, and, and they were red fluorescent, so we actually made them red fluorescent so we could follow them, we could track them easily. They were infused into the colons, into the large intestines of, of several dozen mice with inflammatory bowel disease. And somehow they made their way to the lesions. You might recognize these ulcers. They open up, so they attach, they open up, and like a living band-aid, they seal 
the lesions in the guts of these mice. And this is, uh, experiment was done about seven or eight years ago, and now actually Mamoro has gone on. And as we speak, he is currently transplanting inflammatory bowel disease patients with tissue that was grown from their own healthy parts of their gut. So a tiny, you need a tiny biopsy of one millimeter, can grow it up 10,000 fold, and then currently we test or they test, our collaborators test whether this is safe and whether this actually helps these patients. And here you can see images on the top left, you see an opened uh, large intestine of one of these mice, and you see the Dutch red patches of tissue that der derive from this one stem cell that actually sit in the, in the colon and have repaired this tissue. Now, s first we believe that this was unusual for stem cells, that we could culture them so easily and that they make little organs, organoids, uh, they're now called in culture. Uh, but then Toshi went on to, you, to look at other organs where there's not much cell division, like the pancreas or the lungs or, the, or uh, uh, the liver, for instance. And we found that playing around a little bit with the growth conditions that he had designed, we essentially could coerce uh, any tissue to grow in the lab into the form of these, of these mini organs. And they are very different from cell lines, he didn't say that much, but typically like the gut epithelium, the inner lining consists of about 12 different cell types, highly dedicated cell types that, you, that work together to allow you to digest and uh, take up, to digest food and take up nutrients. These organoids will have all of the cell types that normally sit in a normal gut. You would never see that in a typical classical cell line where the cells are not really mature, they all look the same and they just divide very hard because they are, they are cancer cells. Um, sort of simultaneous with what we were doing, there was a lab in, in Japan uh, led by uh, Yoshiki Sasai, who unfortunately uh, is no longer alive. Um, did something very similar, not using adult stem cells as we had been doing from adult bodies from mice or humans, but starting from these pluripotent cells that also make gastroloids called embryonic stem cells or the synthetic version uh, iPS cells. So these are essentially the stem cells that not just maintain an existing organ, but they can build an entire body. And they do so by starting making gastroloids and then eventually they, they add more and more and, and, and then the whole body uh, uh, arises. And uh, one can actually take these stem cells in vitro and give them biological signals to try to take them to the journey that they normally make during development. And for a mouse this would be uh, uh, two, three weeks. For humans it's much, much slower and takes much, much longer. But it's now possible to start from, from pluripotent stem cells, from these very undifferentiated cells, and turn them into kidney, or turn them into brain, or turn them into heart, and, and hope this movie works. I got this from, uh, from a good friend of mine, Jürgen Knoblich, who actually took Sasai's work uh, several uh, levels further, uh, and grows what in the field is called mini-brains, or cerebral organites. And so you start with these pluripotent stem cells that can become an, any part of your body, uh, and then you take them through a number of steps, trying to copy what normally happens in the, to these cells when the embryo forms. Uh, some cells make liver, some cells make skin, muscle, bone. But these cells you try to push in the direction of the brain. Now, it was already possible to grow neurons. That's one of the many cell types in the brain, but not a brain structure with everything in it. And you can see it's a bit of a complicated uh, black box, but eventually you end up with these little structures that if you look carefully under the microscope, start really looking like a uh, like, uh, human brain. You were saying that, that brain is missing from gastroloids, so these cells can make brain, and I'm sure that if the protocols get better, gastroloids will have developing brain. And uh, this has become very important now to study human brain, because essentially you cannot study human brain like you can study uh, uh, primate brains or mouse brains, and clearly probably the biggest difference between us and, and, and other animals is, is our brain structure. And this starts really looking like, this is a very iconic uh, photo that has gone around the world that really starts looking like it is possible to make human brain. Ethical, I mean, I won't talk about ethics here, but people have been transplanting in the US, have been transplanting these human brains on top of mouse brains. They integrate, they connect. And that, I'm sure, raises a lot of uh, questions that are going to be of great interest to uh, ethicists. Uh, and, of, and when does consciousness arrive? How, how large can these structures be before they start feeling that they are alive? And, and questions like that. So we've done this very differently. Uh, we can grow um, um, 
cancer organoids as well from patients. Now a movie, yeah, this, this movie I was waiting for. So because we now can grow essentially every part of human uh, body in the lab and, and maintain it forever um, and expand it forever, I should say, it should also be possible to grow cancer. Because cancers, as we know, are, of course, will never stop growing. Now that turns out to be uh, the case. Somewhat surprisingly, the healthy tissue is better at expanding when we encourage them than the cancer tissue. They, they make many mistakes when they divide. Um, but we can grow them side by side. Uh, we can sequence the tumor that, that's done widely around the world because cancers have minor mutations. It's changed in the DNA, which makes them a cancer cell and takes them away from being a normal cell. But most importantly, in a personalized uh, fashion, we can now take these cancer cells, expose them to a large number of different drug combinations, and in a personalized fashion, we can now ask what is the best drug combination for an individual patient. This is already being done in, uh, in Holland and in some other European countries for cystic fibrosis, so, so the very expensive cystic fibrosis drugs uh, can be given to patients where, to CF patients, when their organoid test is, uh, is positive, and this is black and white, so they really, the organoids of a patient tell us as an avatar if the patient will or will not respond to a, a certain drug. And there's now multiple labs around the world who are using the sim similar technology what I just showed to see if, uh, if cancer organoids can tell you in an individual fashion if you are, or if you will or you will not respond to a cancer therapy. And you have to realize when you are a cancer patient, you're diagnosed you know, very deeply, but then you're classified and you get a drug combination or a treatment that is good for the class in which you are, but it might not good, good be for your person. It's just the best chance that you get the best treatment. Um, so this might actually be added to, uh, to sequencing and pathology of cancers to uh, basically uh, get an even better therapy than we can give to some of our patients uh, already. Two short uh, stories. So when, when COVID-19 hit the world, we, uh, like almost everybody else in the world, went into a lockdown. We were allowed to do uh, COVID uh, research in our institute in Utrecht, and we collaborated with a uh, corona lab in Rotterdam, led by Bart Haagmans, and, and Bart Lamers, his PhD student. We realized that um, although it's a, it's a pulmonary infection, as you all know, uh, patients often presented with intestinal problems, nausea, uh, diarrhea, stomach aches, and because we can grow all organs essentially in the lab of, of an individual human being, we could quite easily team up with the virologists in Rotterdam and expose the different organs that we could grow to the virus. And indeed, it, look, it looks like the intestine is the, uh, the organ that's most readily infected and produces most viral particles. We, we published this early on in, in 2020 with, with our Rotterdam colleagues. Um, Slide is, yeah, here you can see the virus. So in green, you see a microscopic cut through a, a human gut organoid. And then in white, you see uh, the bad guy, the virus, stained here. And the virus comes in from the inside, infects the cells. And then the, the white cells start actually producing viral particles. And they, again, they, they secrete them, they extrude them to the inside of the mini gut here. In the lungs, the same thing happens. And you can also see if you wait two or three days, the entire organoid is now affected. Two neighboring organoids uh, in the right image are still only green. There's no white, so there is no virus. This was not so spectacular. People have actually built on this to follow the, follow the pandemic in cities, because if you take samples from the sewers, and you can actually measure the amount of virus that's in the sewers, and it presumably comes from the infected guts of patients. And when it goes up, you know, pandemic is on the rise in the city, and many cities now monitor the, where the virus is by taking samples from the, from the sewers. More importantly, uh, you might have all heard of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine as a proposed drug, actually, for for for, uh, for COVID, um, it actually works well in the standard cell lines, and actually Vero E6 is a cell line that virology labs often use. So if you you can infect it with the virus and then treat it with chloroquine and it kills the virus, based on this, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of patients around the world have been treated with chloroquine, which is a malaria drug. Pretty, pretty strong side effects. Uh, it's now concluded it doesn't work. It doesn't help patients at all. And actually, we have tested this on, uh, on organoids. On the right, I won't take you through the graph, but organoids are essentially not 
Uh, so they can be infected, you add chloroquine, and they don't care about chloroquine, the virus will reproduce. And the explanation is that in these cancer cell lines, the virus get in and into the cells in a very different way. You see that on the left, there's a sort of, a, it's called endocytosis, the virus is taken up by the cell in its entirety and then released inside the cell. That step is blocked by chloroquine, but the way it infects real cells, we would call our, our organoid cells real cells, is very different. The virus actually sits on the top of the cell, that's where it enters, it then fuses with the membrane of the cell and directly injects the RNA molecule, the genome, into the host cell. So there is no uptake of the virus and therefore no sensitivity to chloroquine. So one thing that could be learned here, this was all done too late, we already knew that, that uh, chloroquine didn't work, but maybe the next time there's a new virus, not only work with the easy cell lines that, that everybody knows how to do, but also include steps where more human, more normal uh, organoid-like models are are used. And finally, uh, the, uh, the technology is not only uh, limited to, uh, to human tissue, we think we can use this for any vertebrate tissue, for threatened uh, uh, species, for instance, that you'd like to, uh, to immortalize the genome from. Snake venom, is snake venom, as you might not realize, but sharks kill about a dozen people a year around the world. Snakes kill about 100,000 people around the world every year, mostly uh, lower income countries. Half a million people get blind or, or lose a limb. Uh, so there really are, there's a really a huge unmet need. Very little m modern science here. There are vaccines for the venom, but they're made in horses. This is like 19th century uh, technology. Um, it turns out that we can actually grow these organoids quite rapidly. Here you look with an electron microscope inside. The top on the right image is actually the venom. So they make enormous amounts of venom, these, these glands. Um, venom, so this could have two, um, two applications. One would be making anti-venom to treat patients who are bitten by, by snakes. Second, there is about 20 or 30 very active biological compounds in venom. There's about two and a half thousand venomous snake species and there's other venomous reptiles. Uh, so this would be in principle something like 50,000 potential drugs and about 10 of the venomous components currently are in use as drugs. So they could also be uh, a source of new medicines. And with that, I think I reached the end of my talk that I don't have to show you. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> So thank you very much, Ninke and Hans. Very nice lectures overlapping and addressing each other. So I'm sure there are some questions. Please go ahead. Ah, Ra Ralph brings the. It's a question to both. Uh, I think you got the, because both uh, focused on this point. What first of all? What are the advantages of? gastroloids on IPS. You, ha you mentioned the IPS. Is uh, Yamanaka's uh, recommendation over now? Uh, are we inventing the wheel when something in science has already provided a substitute to embryo experimentation? This is obviously what you mentioned is the uh, research level, the uh, um, research on, on embryos but not the clinical application. When they come to the clinical application, uh, to uh, genome editing, the problem still remains using the embryos. In fact, the cutoff date of 14 days, now the discussion among the scientific community is to extend it to 28 <coughs> weeks. 28 days. weeks. In fact, days. Uh, uh, twen 28, 28 days. days. Yes. <laughs> 28 days. <laughs> Uh, last year, when we were discussing this point at the European Group of Ethics, some of the members tried to impose this on member states. And we objected that this is a matter of principle of subsidiarity. It's the member state which has to decide the cutoff date. Uh, so the scientific community are claiming that the 28 days are more advantageous to that. When we come to the clinical, not the research. How do you react to these uh, points? First of all, the advantage of what you are proposing to IPS, and secondly, whether it's true that the 28, week, 28 days, it's more advantageous. And this would not resolve the question of the status of the human embryo on the uh, clinical application, not the research, clinical application. 
so we don't do this this research first of all but because we work with the other cell types but I, I know many of the labs that do this so the field is is moving extremely fast at the moment in the past two years I guess the the, the cover of cell that you showed illustrates that and uh, I am sure that if this continues that 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 the embryos will get as they call it better and better so more looking like real embryos and there there's going to be a huge ethical question because eventually I think there is no I think everything eventually can be done in the lab, and 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 eventually an individual will grow out if if one if we keep on pushing the, pushing these these boundaries. Now, so so there we need really strong guidelines, and scientists are not the best ethicists, at least biologists are not the best ethicists in general because they're just curious. They want to know the next step. They 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 have not learned to easily step back. So we've learned actually to involve people like Nienke in our meetings that actually uh, point out to us, hey, now you you have a new technology. Have you thought about this and this consequence? Should we not step back? And uh, the reason why uh, why people are particularly interested in this stage of embryogenesis, it's around the stage that the embryo implants, and there's a lot of infertility that happens at that stage. So many. Uh, parents cannot get children because this stage go wrong and we know almost nothing about about this stage because it was always impossible to investigate this so that's one of the main reasons I think why but at least the reasons that, that people write up why this is very important uh, uh, research but there's always a next step and if, if implantation if we've solved implantation the next step will again be extremely interesting and things will go wrong and there will be patients that suffer from that and 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 we want to investigate that so i think it's really this is really a, a field that is in need of strong ethical uh, considerations Um, thank you both. That was, that was really fascinating and all. So I like the idea of the conundrums that come out of this research. And one of the ones that strikes me as being pretty fascinating is that the norm in animal research, for instance, with rodents, right? If something goes wrong with the research and the animal begins to suffer in a way that was not anticipated, right? The answer is you euthanize the animal. So in this trajectory, if something goes wrong when you put the neural tissue from the human in with the mouse brain, and the mouse turns around and says, what are you doing? <laughs> what do you do? Do you euthanize the animal? Or have you got something else now that you have to have a whole new way of caring for than you wouldn't have had before? Similarly, if you create an embryo, even by mistake. So it does add a whole new layer of what do you do with your quote unquote mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in between. Yeah, so, so here again, so I mentioned this uh, because these are published experiments, something that I don't think uh, in my lab we would do. I wouldn't see the scientific question. I mean, I mean the transplantation of human brain onto a mouse. Uh, but I guess what was attempted was to show that this is really functional brain that it can connect to uh, to a real brain. Um, not sure how important that question was. Uh, yeah, and then of course uh, the question that you raise immediately arises. Uh, so this is again, I think, uh, a moment where we have to step back and and see uh, see what we want to do there. I fully I fully agree. And but the same thing as as we already discussed holds for the gastroids. I think. Thank you. So we have, I think, room for one more question, if you wish so. So I have one question to Mr. Clevers. Um, you had some slides on chloroquine, and uh, you basically just proved that it is healing in any way COVID, and that was proclaimed back then by Donald Trump, for example, that it should be taken by, by the... Uh, yeah, citizens of the U.S. to cure themselves. So that was big fake news um, based on a few publications that uh, were on the research with cancer cells. And you just proved it. So how was the public response to your results back then? Because that's kind of interesting. Cause 
Yeah, so, so first of all, we were late. Uh, um, the standard models in virology are the ones that they showed. They've been extremely useful over the many, many years. Uh, I think we showed this about a year ago, and it was already widely known that chloroquine in patients doesn't help. I don't think it convinced any of the people who do believe in chloroquine that still take chloroquine. But we're also not the only ones. There were like three or four other studies at about the same time showing show exactly the same result. So I think the consequence of that will be that maybe next time, if there's, if there's going to be a new virus, that actually these types of models will be used much, much earlier in the process. That's what we hope. Thank you very much.